Good afternoon, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to Denver, Colorado. We are on the back end of day two of our two days of live coverage from MWISE. My name is Savannah Peterson, co-hosting all week with John Furrier. John, I know, I think you might be the most excited about the next segment. Well, first of all, I love this one of my favorite shows of the year because it's really packed with a lot of payload of great content and expertise that's hitting one of the most important things in the world as, as AI and then the, it comes on new technologies. People need to use them for efficiency, but also maintaining their posture and advancing their capabilities to bridge that gap on the symmetries and the bad guys and the good guys. And we have the star of the show, whose keynotes are always a must watch, the CEO himself here. So I'm super pumped. Yes, please welcome Kevin Mandia. Thank you so much John, for joining thank us. You. Savannah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's fun. Kevin, I got to tell you, I don't think I've ever heard John quote a keynote more than he has quoted your keynote over the last yeah, two sure, days. Sure, yeah. So it, it clearly resonated. Yeah. I I would love for, since actually probably most of the folks watching haven't had a chance to see that keynote, if you just give us the top three bullet points. Top three bullet points, great question. Those are the hardest ones to answer. I give you the top 20 bullet points. <laughs> no, I talked about something that I talk about all the time, but never in front of large groups. I talked about the questions boards ask when I'm mm -hmm. presenting to the boardroom. What are the board of directors worried about in cyber? Because it's this confusing thing. Then I talked about uh, the CISO role and that I believe the CISO role is up for a change. It's more and more responsibilities or jump balls are existing in security. Like who's going to do AI security? Who's going to do the data security to see what's going into the model, what's coming out of the model? Who's doing supply chain security? Security, when you look at the CISO role, it's new to the table. You know, you've had CIOs and CFOs and heads of HR for years and years and years before suddenly this yeah. chief information security officer pops up. So uh, I talked about that. So that's only two things. Board concerns, and I did say what my answers normally are to those top 10 questions that boards ask. And then uh, the CISO jump balls and how CISO should advocate yeah. directly for what their role and remit should be. You know, what's interesting is that the CISO roles are changing. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot more physical security involved now, right. too. Um, not just, you know, the online. Right. A lot of physical, so you're seeing a C chief security officer right. role, CISO. So a lot more, I won't say fragmentation, but much more of, a, of adjacencies around right. the role. Well, someone that's got to do supply chain security, physical security, uh, all the different things that, you know, you could give it to the lawyer, general counsel. You could give even security governance to a lawyer, or you can give it to the CISO. The CISO is the new person on the block, and they've got to figure out yep. what's in my wheelhouse, what can I do? I've had five CISOs work for me, John, and nobody ever came into my office asking for more, but I definitely walked down the hall to my CISO and said, I want you, because you have a security mindset, to be our supply chain security person, not the CFO yeah. and not somebody else. But then I wonder, how often is the CISO right down the hall from the CEO? Probably not that often. But there's just, I think I had about 15 jump balls on the slide, John, and yeah. someone's got to do them. I just know my risk profile. I want someone whose security yeah. mindset comes first, yeah. and then they can help yeah. address the issue. I love that security mindset. Talk about that security mindset and jump balls, because yeah. you mentioned a lot of that, and resilience was kind of weaved in there. Talk about jump balls. What does yeah. that mean, and sure. uh, what's that security mindset that people well, should have? For a security mindset, what that means is I've had a lot of CEOs ask me, you know, closed room one-on-one usually, hey, is my CISO any good? Yeah, because a lot of times I'm there after something <laughs> happened. And their CISOs yeah. are good. But I don't, I can't answer that question unless I have years to observe yeah. the management skills of a CISO operationally, or you, you know, or I dive into their technical skills. So I had to come up with questions, and this started like 20 years ago. What are questions you can ask your CISO to at least see, do they have the right frame of mind, right security mindset? So question number one is, how would you break into us? Meaning, what are our weak spots? If you ask a CISO, hey, what's our weak spots? And they go, oh, geez, I don't know. It's, I would worry, yeah. you know, they've got to be thinking all the time, here's our weak spot and we're doing something about it. And here's the next weak spot and we're doing something about it. I worry they're a little naive in that moment. Yeah, it, it, it just shows a lack of that security mindset. And you yeah. can see it. Some people yeah. approach security, maybe not from, they weren't in the military or they didn't do law enforcement. They kind of came up more on the policy side, policy side. What I've learned is security is like almost a calling. You, you just have it or you don't. Yeah. And, and um, you can be good as a CISO, yeah. but you can be great as a CISO yeah. if you're constantly thinking, where's the threat going to yeah. come from and what are we going to do about it? It's like, it's intrinsic, right? It's like a basketball yeah. player. You can teach someone how to play, but if they're not tall enough, yeah. you know, it's I like, know. yeah. I want to ask you then, sure. what was the moment you felt security call you? 
Uh, my whole life. I mean, I, I go back I in time. I mean, I have a master's in forensic science, joined the military, took an oath to defend the Constitution, was in law enforcement to another oath. It, it's just some people just are grown to let's protect others. Let's do something about society, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people have it. Yeah. And it's easy to build on that. Yeah. Um, and some people are maybe more scientific. I want to solve science problems. I want to be the yeah. person who cures cancer, whatever it is. Um, there's callings that drive you to be more successful. And to go back to the basketball analogy, if you want to have game as a CISO, starts with security mindset. To me, yeah. I may be wrong, but that's just my belief. Yeah. And having had five CISOs, that's the questions I ask. You what, know, what are you worried about? I think this whole profiling of the psychology is huge because we're living more in an era of mechanisms, yeah, playbooks, sure. which is cool. Right. You can have rules and understand things, but there's a craft right. in this job. Right. Creativity, judgment calls. You sure. call it a red lever on yeah. the keynote. So give us your thoughts on that, because I think that it really becomes, I think, state of the art right now is where it's the combination of the playbooks and the mechanism you have put in place. Sure, there's yeah. a lot of governance, some say over-governing, but... Um, you have that, but you have to have situational awareness. Oh, totally. I mean, you don't want to go out in that open field right. without support, and, and the bad guys are coming in. Yeah, well, I think, you know, in addition to security mindset, for a CISO to be a successful, they have to get managerial skills, know how to hire, know how to fire, know how to communicate, know how to hold people accountable. All these other skills, yesterday we interviewed some CISOs, and all of them really came up through the technical track. Yeah. You know, hey, we were on the keyboard and we were yeah. computer science majors and we were interested yeah. in responding to breaches. You can come into it via audit, you can come into it other tracks as well, but you, you have to want that security track. What we've learned, you kind of can, easiest thing to do, John, is just compare and contrast yeah. CFO. CFO shows up to a boardroom and says, everything's in the green. And every board member goes, okay because we've been doing it for over 100 years, green's green, got the controls, generally acceptable accounting principles, we're good. CISO comes in the boardroom, everything's in the green, and everybody's like, whoa, wait a minute. We trust that answer, wait a minute. We don't have any norms yet, we haven't matured into it yet, we haven't had 100 years of CISOs to really get our blocking and tackling done and get consistency yeah. to how we report. And that'll go to your last point, the CISO's job then is always making calls subjectively with lots of unknowns. Yeah. How secure are we? Um, we're good, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I we're mean, we're in the yellow medium. Degree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Savannah and I, blue. Savannah yeah. and I have been uh, yeah. kind of auditing because kind of the interviews here, and this year, it's interesting, one of the comments to that point is the CISO doesn't have a lot of time to kind of lean back and reflect and look at the big picture. Um, it's either putting peanut butter over all the fires they're putting out yeah. or what are going to do with Gen AI. And that's been the theme from some of the boardrooms. Okay, yeah, sure. Hey, I got a lot of problems. I'll put them out. And what am I going to do with Gen AI? Yeah. Seems to be the kind of categorical mindset today. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Um, is that over it, it, or um, every The concerns of a CISO is different based on the industry the CISO's in, based on the maturity of the programs they have. Uh, you know, pre-breach, pro-speech, because sometimes the energy and security can wane. If you have a breach, oh, you get religion quick, and you have a very vigilant security program for a few years, but over time, that autonomous running, that, uh, you know, the, it just gets this, you know, homeostasis yeah. that bores great people, quite frankly, yeah. you know? And then, so the team might wane, and then you have to come back up to that mindset. So I'm not answering your question directly. I just think sisters have a lot of concerns. Yeah. You can go from, I feel good about our security today, to, wait a minute, what just happened? Yeah. There was a zero day, like, in that program? unknown risk immediately erupts at the company. So last year, you, when we talk about Gen AI, you're like, sure. okay, it's good for paperwork, help us out, and yeah, all that's his run work, yeah. faster. This year, you said, just unequivocally, hey, people are going to be using it. They're going to get use used to it, absolutely. have policies. What's what, what well, think, on that? You know, when it comes up in the boardroom, people are just, you know, there's almost the same framework that shows up every time. First, the realization, our people are going to use AI period, to be better at their jobs. That's a good thing. So we better get the policy out now. Almost like the end user or yeah. acceptable use policies of yeah. the 1990s. Yeah. Browsers came out, people were going out on the internet, and companies said, well, we're going to need some rules here because we don't have centralized control just yet. Same thing with AI. I don't think too many companies have centralized control. People are working in remote environments, they're getting consumer yeah. subscriptions to artificial intelligence, and they're getting help drafting emails, getting help yeah. drafting speeches, getting help drafting code. It's going to happen. So then you got to wonder what data is going in, yeah. what's coming out. Yeah, you exactly. Know? So you get your policy done. Yeah. Figure out how your company is going to use yeah. Gen AI and those tools. Figure out policies around that. Get a committee maybe to say what's the first use case. Let's pilot the first use case. Let's make sure we know the data coming in, the data coming out. Let's continuously monitor yeah. it. 
it's the same pattern of risk management that people have had for years, so. You know, one of the quotes on the, on the keynote that jumped out at me, I really like this part. It, I like when you do your keynotes, because one, you're a great communicator. Thank you. And then you kind of weave in some, some personal stuff, right. kind of anecdotal. You said, um, what do CEOs wish they could do before a breach, or after a breach? What can they do before a breach happened if they can go back and get a mulligan or a do-over. Yeah. Uh, and you went on a great tear there. You said more redlining, tabletop exercise, which yeah, you emphasize because yeah. you, you love tabletops. Yeah. Uh, totally. Obviously, um, practice red lever events. Right. Um, explain that, because Sven and I were unpacking yeah, that okay. all yesterday. And so, yeah, yeah red, red lever, lever mulligans, what do they yeah. realize and what happens next? Well, first, I've wanted to do red lever events where you see a you know, oh my, you look at your monitor and go, oh, there's a packet on the internet and see if you can unplug in time, and you can't, by the way. A red lever event is things like practicing your resilience for real. Can we recover our critical applications? There's a lot of companies that have said, we need to make backups of our critical assets. We need to make sure our backups are secure. Almost none of them practice the red lever event of, damn it, let's go through the drill of shutting down and redoing it. Most because it impacts business, and, or they may not have the time or resources to do it. I think one of the enterprises that are big yeah. and old school will actually do the red lever event of what I used to call disaster recovery. Could be a hurricane, yeah. could be uh, an intrusion, could be ransomware, but you got to be able to say, if Miami goes down, how do we pop up and start running arrest in Virginia? That's a red lever event and you, you practice that. Another red lever event is from a CISO perspective, can we get off the grid? You know, let's say we have data being stolen from our organization right now, and we find the data we're losing intolerable. Sometimes the safest and easiest thing to do is just say, you know what, I'm the world's going to know anyway. <laughs> That's red lever event. The whole company is no longer on the internet. You can't do XFIL. That's a hard thing to do. Most companies cannot do that. You know, I've gone through that drill before, yeah. and I think that's a severe case, but yeah. and but it does come up where there's times where maybe the threats are so grave to yeah. your company, you know, like let's say Log4j like attack comes out again, and you look at your network and go, we can't risk this portion of our network, and we just don't know, just yeah. contain it immediately, well, boom, red lever. It's better to turn off the lights than it is to have everything compromised, it, and, it, and it makes perfect sense. It, it, it's, there's grace, more graceful ways to do things, but at the end of the day, the red lever is practicing the extreme yeah. to make sure you're ready for it. And I'll give you one more. Can you operate your business off the internet? Period. Mm -hmm. Things beyond your control as a company, suddenly, you're not on the internet. And what I've learned is a lot of companies can. And, it, it, and to include, years ago, there was a uh, ransomware attack that impacted a vendor that had a lot of impact on restaurants. And a lot of restaurants shut down. And I was thinking, okay, we used to have restaurants before the internet, but they never trained for taking orders, not on an iPad. Yeah. Hey, having a, a paper system. I think there's a lot of industry that can just say, hey, if the grid goes off for whatever reason, yeah. We can still operate critical functions this way. Well, I think we saw this a lot. We were talking about it earlier with the CrowdStrike instance. Right. And with that being a resilience, everyone realizes all of a sudden, oh my goodness, yeah. this is so mission critical. And a lot of companies were completely down as a result of that. I, yeah, and, and those things happen like every 10 years or so. You know, it, it's, you're going to have an update and everybody, you know, everybody wants perfect software all the time. And the government will say, why aren't we making perfect software secure by design? There are a lot of companies trying as hard as they can with the knowledge that they have and the capability they have to do so. But it's really hard to tell that when we make software that depends on software that depends on software from a bunch of different folks, sometimes vulnerabilities can emerge and unexpected conditions can emerge. So, How about the power dynamics between yeah. defense which you love, right? And compliance, which Phil yeah. does. Oh, because, Phil's great. Think, because yeah. you know there is a CFO angle too here, right? right? And CIO and CEO. Um, the CFOs have to write the checks, and they're out of business if it yeah. goes out of business. So, yeah. So, what's the power dynamic? How are organizations dealing with that? Well, it's not a power dynamic to me. You refer to Phil Venables. I think he's the best in the world at governance. Like he just has so long of a career and thinking about things different. And I, I was always, here's the threats we're responding to, and can we stop them? And they, and that's a good security practice to come from that way. But you also have to come from what's our governance, what's our risk management, and how do we drill down? Because you're not always going to be in a gang fight all the time. Yeah. I think they go hand in hand. Yeah. You got to come from the right with governance and policy and just great execution of programs you put in place. Yeah. And then you test those with how I came at it with threats and autonomous testing. It's all really one. It's just your frame of reference and how you. How is the working relationship to make that a, not a power dynamic, but an integrated, seamless oh, it's teamwork? Integrated. It has to. How, how should people start getting that muscle? 
What are some of the best practices I mean, of, of doing that integration, you know, pass, shoot, score kind of teamwork? I think the 1A enterprises already have that muscle, John, I really do. You have great governance at, especially the banks, by the way, financial services, they understand risk. They understand that framework. They've had governance oh, policies yeah. on financial risk, and then they kind of created the cyber ones. And, and they've always had, Here's our 110 controls. Here's our technology that's applied to those controls. Here's the benchmark we're measured against. And here's the people assigned for those controls. So they have the people, process, yeah. and technology relatively mapped. I think it's just part of good governance to test it. Yeah. And I was always just the myopic test guy. <laughs> we shoot the bullets, see how we do on a continuous basis. But you need it to be realistic testing, yeah. and that's where the incident response work comes in. Yeah, we did an article um, on our still kind of our Cube research team that got published on The Economist two weeks ago around right. digital twins. And very much a manufacturing kind of concept, but moving into the enterprise now with AI right. and all this data with the governance, AI is becoming a, a power source for productivity, automation, right. intelligence, reasoning, et cetera. Is there a digital twin opportunity in cyber defense to kind of do that redlining, to do that simulations? Is there a, a, a pass where, you know, I know you got a technical yeah, background. Right. I mean, it might, I don't see anything yet out there, but we're watching this closely because that could be an area to optimize for, to well, simulate. Is that something? Yeah, I think, the, when it, if I went right to, a lot of times you, there's probably 90 plus percent of your network, you'll test it. You'll test it with, you know, in a safe and simple way. But let's say you're NASA and you do launches, or you're SpaceX and you do launches, or you have an OT network and you don't want to shut down the grid in Los Angeles. There's machines that we don't touch during our red team exercises. <laughs> but it would be nice to maybe have that digital twin that's an exact replication so you can accurately say, you know what, our OT environment is safe because we have a replica of it that's authentic and genuine and we can test that. Yeah. That's probably, there's probably a space to do that. Uh, there's probably organizations that do do that. Yeah. But what I've observed normally is um, we're always just testing the outside in or the inside. You get a sliver of access on yeah. the inside and how far can you go? Usually our red teams are reduced in scope. It's not like you can access anything anytime you want, and the next thing you know, our conveyor belt stops. You know, you can't do that to yeah. companies. You know, you talk about stress testing at scale and your keynote, and you know, digital yeah. twins maybe could be a solution. Talk about the, the impact of resilience, because cyber resilience, which is recovery, cyber recovery right. or disaster recovery, it's got all kinds of connection points, interconnects. What does resilience look like as that aperture increases? Because now resilience could be not just recovery, it's managing uh, the intelligence data coming sure. in, more telemetry. So does resilience expand and how do you measure it? What's the metrics competition? I'm very simplistic on resilience. This might be a third grade answer from a guy from Pittsburgh, but the way I looked at it first, the threat environment got us better at it. Right? Ransomware was all really about resilience. It was find your assets that matter, back them up, and reduce the blast radius so that if somebody came in and they had valid access or valid credentials, they couldn't just spray and pray to every machine and shut you down. So people started segmenting, yeah. people started thinking about it. And after a few years of ransomware, I'm actually getting the question about resilience less in the boardroom today than in 2019 and 2020. But the question asked when you really want to test resilience is you have a tested answer when the CEO turns to whoever's in charge of resilience, because sometimes it's not the CISO, it's the CIO. Well, how, how fast are we yeah. running? How fast do we get this part of our business up and running? And the answer's 3.5 hours. They know, they already know. And to me, yeah. you want to get ahead of that, here's what we're doing to prevent yeah. the problem. However, you also want to be able to answer the question, we're up in three hours, yeah. sir, if this happens. <laughs> I'm curious, and one of the one of the big conversations we've had here is the the increasing visibility of the cyber resilience and cybersecurity right. conversation within the board and right. the C-suite. I'm sure you've seen this pattern. What are some of the, and I know you, you answered the, the top 10 questions you were getting in your keynote, but I'm curious, what are some of the other trends outside of the CISO that, that people are asking? Are there consistent questions the CFO is curious about? Who's hard to convince in the investment? What's, what's yeah. the rest of that landscape so, look like? A lot of CFO questions come at me based on my background. <laughs> <laughs> and if they did, I'd be like, hey, you no, know, I real just the accounting, and that's why I have a bunch auditing us every year. It, it was uh, the questions I get from people, sometimes it's just geopolitics. Hey, you go to Washington all the time, what do we worry? about, you know, what's the impact in cyber of the Straits of Taiwan, the Israeli Hezbollah, Israeli Hamas, um, the 
technological race for AI between China and the US. Quantum computing hasn't come up much, but it's going to start emerging. Uh, so, but I would say geopolitics will come up. Let's just talk about how that may impact your security program. Yeah. And let's face it, any conflict, geopolitical, economic, or ideological, or even kinetic, will have a cyber component. And, uh, and, and what that cyber component is, is actually expanding. It's not getting yeah. smaller. I mean, every oh, no. nation is leaning in to have more influence in the cyber division. Talk about espionage, because this comes, we yeah. were talking about that earlier. Yeah. About, uh, we, there's a lot of state actors, the apex attackers are, right. you used that term last time. With, what's the state of that union there? Because with, there's more chaos, there's disruption. Right. We hear people tunneling in and well, getting into certain critical systems and critical infrastructure here in the sure. U.S. Um, what is the um, tactics and apex attackers doing? Yeah, well, we know what they are and, and you, we're doing better at it. And first off, let's go to why do attackers have to use what I call apex methodologies? Our endpoint software is getting better at defending us. We're creating more software that thinks, learns, and adjusts. There's a huge push to, sh as people call it in the business, shift left and secure by design. I mean, it's a constant message. And engineers really don't want to ship in secure code. Yeah. They may not know how to do it. Um, so we got to keep making it. And there's a ton of technologies coming out to make it easier to ship secure. We got to fix identity. You know, we're all taking the easy ride on identity. We got to do better at securing the identities because we have a faceless internet now. <laughs> uh, we have better intel sharing. That's a long winded answer, John, that we're getting better and better on defense. The challenge is just the scalability and the asymmetry of good offense. You know, it, it's. Again, we're just playing goalie in cyber, and I know that frustrates the government yep. folks sometimes when I say that, because governments reform to protect citizens, protect the citizens' companies, but we don't have strong deterrence in the cyber domain when you have safe harbors in Russia, North Korea, China. Yeah. And, and I'm talking safe harbors for cyber criminals even. Yeah. Like, we all know espionage is going to exist, and I think yeah. you know, everybody will understand that. Most nations will understand it, but the criminal element and the ransomware and the extortion it's really hard to say we're currently having successful deterrence there. On the cyber criminal side, it's become quite the, the industry, as we say in Silicon Valley, product market fit. They're not stopping. It's, it's no, no, but, but I, it, you know, as I just said, we're having little deterrence. We're getting better on defense, and I think we're getting better at faster attribution, and we're working with everything within our means yeah. to start imposing more risk. The best risk you can give a cyber criminal is you grab that person. Law enforcement gets still. That's yeah. the best risk you can impose. Um, you can't just keep whack a mole and we shut yeah. down another ransom group because they just come back. Tomorrow. How is that going? I just saw the FBI had a, yeah. a news release out on yeah. that botnet they took down. Yeah. Is, are they yeah. more proactive going after totally. the bad guys? Absolutely. I mean, always getting more proactive. The thing is, it, 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 and it raises the cost. It's just that I think by now, cyber criminals do cyber, cyber you know, criminal activities every day. It's their 10 hours a day thing. So we're raising the cost, but they're still just going to come back. You know what I mean? The yeah. best deterrent, uh, the best deterrent is getting them physically. You know, yeah. getting a hand on them. Yeah. How how heavy is your collaboration then with with? I mean, I know you've worked on both sides of the government and private sure. party. How much collaboration is going on to actually take these guys down when it does happen, like we saw with the I FBI? I think there's a ton of collaboration. It really is yeah. all within the, law, the laws and the rules of the nation, right, that, that you, you know, you're hosted by. Uh, and, you know, because privacy will always come first and you have to uh, you follow the rules. So if we have something we think is relevant, we still got to get a subpoena yeah. from law enforcement yeah. uh, to provide that. And there, there might be exceptions to that, but we've always said intel sharing to defend your networks is very easy. Intel sharing for actual attribution has some additional hurdles to it. Yeah. So one of the things coming back full circle to the customers and the private sector, where all the action is, certainly on, on the criminal side, um, not maybe not so much public, but criminal healthcare is getting hit a lot. Yeah. What are some of the most impactful cyber defense tips uh, that you could share, uh, state of the art? Yeah, again, I'd go right to what do you wish you did before the intrusion? Red yeah. team your network. If there's a front door in, find it first and shut it. Um, and then I would also give the red team access on your network, give them a credential and see what they can do with that. Um, and you have to make sure you have tons of visibility yep. to what's going on in your network. And if you're expanding via M&A, have a great process uh, when you get bought. Like with yeah. Google, when we got bought, it wasn't like Mandy Machines just popped up on the Google network. No, it, it, by the time we're on the Google network, we are Google equipment, Google tokens, Google everything. And that's a great way to, and not everybody can do that, yeah. but you want to try to, because when you buy a company, a lot of times you're the bigs, 
they're the smalls, you're talking them in, and they didn't have the resources you had. So I see a lot of vulnerabilities, like you can go back to the Microsoft yeah. one from last year, they bought a company, and when they bought that company, there was compromise in it. And it's really hard to find compromise yeah. retroactively you, because you'll go scan every endpoint. Yeah. What if that endpoint was on your network that day? Yeah. You didn't get to scan it, you didn't get to look. Yeah. What if you monitor their network, but the attacker's not active for the 25 days you monitor? Yeah. It, it's, uh, you got to do a lot of I'm work. I'm sure Google's very happy to get Mandy in. I, yeah. The due diligence was much faster than, say, some of those other companies, given your, your uh, security we're mindset. We're so targeted, yeah. John. Yeah. You know, we had yeah. our own breach, too, you yeah. know, back in 2020 with the, uh, the yeah. SolarWinds uh, backdoor yeah. that we had. Uh, so we are not impervious, yeah. you know, and we do everything we can with vigilance, but it sometimes we bring the ear, the, yeah. the ire, the whole, you know, cyber criminal element at us, so. You know, when you were up on stage, you made a comment, I, well, I, it was kind of in passing, but it was a comment, it was mostly yeah. about your first law of philosophy. Yeah. You said, um, quote, I want to see all the lateral movement. That's just who I am. Describe that mindset, because your lateral movement is seeing things. I think all security professionals want to have visibility. It is a weird thing if someone's saying, how secure are we? And you go, well, I don't know because I think I have 80% visibility. It, it is, uh, some of the times, uh, you know, I would go out and I'd talk to a system, I'd be like, so how many endpoints do you have? And they'll say, oh, we have 42,812. I'm like, you're 98% sure or 70% sure? And all of a sudden they're like, mm, it's 80-ish. That's why you need the, the whole, and I, I'm, it's, it stinks that I'm old school, that whole, you know, defense and depth thing, but it's real in that you have to have network monitoring to see all your assets, and then you have to have endpoint, because between the two, yeah. you, you get a fuller vision of what you got. And lateral movement is because that's what the attackers are pattern is, they move around, try to find well, they things. they get in and they break into your identity architecture. They get a user ID and passphrase that works, and then the lateral movement is them, you know, it's like they get to the John Smith account, yeah. and now there's yeah. a bad guy logging in as John Smith, not yeah. user at the right. John Smith. You, may, okay. All right. you mentioned um, OT earlier. How far are we along in terms of those that technology? Because, you know, the old joke is they run Windows machines too, Windows 95 machines. Not, I'm just, you know, being over the top. Every critical right. infrastructure is testing their stuff. And, and, and it comes down to, you know, we do red teaming all the time for critical infrastructure that do have industrial control systems, OT environments. And what you look for is, if there's going to be a problem there, it's either an insider on the OT network, you look for great segmentation between the TCP IP network and the controls and then the, uh, the OT environment. Do you see patterns around developers and engineers who are building solutions uh, in this modern era, getting closer to the hardware? On the AI side, we've been doing a lot of reporting around some of the kernel advancements, uh, AI companies going to custom silicon. Okay. So you're seeing developers getting as close to the performance with the GPUs and all that area. Are you seeing a pattern on the on the on your side, on the threat defense side, where the coding is getting closer to with is less, it, it, or is that not? Not necessarily. I think it'll be more of an indirect impact. Like, you're, you know, Google's a company that makes an, a Gemini, and it can answer about any darn question we have in many different languages in seconds. And so I, I just, I know that what they're building there, security is a subset. I mean, there's, a, there's like, you know, yeah. we created SecPalm, a large language model in security. I'm pretty confident that's a simpler thing than trying to understand 400 languages and answering any question about anything and you know that many languages. So I think we will leverage what you're describing in security to just have a very comprehensive view. And um, I don't know if we get truly yeah. autonomous, yeah. but you'll have more of an autonomous posturing of a security program to be harder okay. uh, to hack. My final question for you sure. is if you're, um, with all your wisdom, experience, um, and where you are now, with what you know now, and you came in, and you were right out of PhD program, coming into this cyber world, right? How would you look at that next twenty mile stair uh, in the market? Um, knowing was you young, you could go build a next company or do whatever. What would you do? Maybe not differently, but what would you be thinking about? I think. It's a great question. Like, what's next for cyber? Absolutely yeah. the leveraging of the AI capability. And, and go, we're going to go through the phase of the security experts that have been around for 20 years, doing the human in the loop for what AI can do over the next year, because I think it's coming mm -hmm. very quickly, and slowly over time get more and more autonomous. And that's what I'd be thinking about, is this, you need, the intrusions happen so fast, you do need to respond at machine speed. And there's a lot of folks that say, oh, if we had secure code, we'd be fine. That's not the case. The reality is, 
there's a reason why there's always been crime in, in the human world. There's always been espionage. It's about human behavior. If we shut everybody out where nobody could ever hack any company, John, you'll yeah. be hiring people that are going to try to steal something from you. Yeah. There's always been a certain amount of crime and a certain amount of economic uh, theft. And so I think cyber is going to be important and AI is going to be critical shift change to how we do it effectively. Absolutely. One of the things we've actually been discussing on stage today is will security and, and the industry drive the adoption of AI? From what you just said, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Absolutely. much more broadly. All right, final question for you because sure. wow. you're a regular guest and yeah. this has been a very fast yeah. half an hour. Not and it feels and like is such a super fan yeah. of your keynotes, so this is actually perfect. Yeah. <laughs> what do you hope to be able to say, specifically this time next year when we're at MYS, that you can't yet say today? Well, you'd love to say, hey, no healthcare companies got extorted over the last 12 months. Perfect. I mean, that'd be a great thing. It's, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous what those companies have to go through. It is, and, and yeah. the innocent people caught yep. in the mix of that, totally. that have nothing to do with that. So that's pretty myopic, but I mean, we'd love to be able to say there's no victims. Wow, that's great. Yeah. However we get there. Honestly, yeah, we gotta get there. Right? Honestly, that's one of the best things you could yeah. say. I love it. Kevin, you're thank fabulous. You. I see what John. Thank you, Savannah. So thank you, John. thank you for all the great yeah. questions. And thank all of you for tuning in to our two days of the live coverage here in Denver, Colorado at MYS. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity news.